Okay, it's 9.30. Everybody can still hear me, is that fair? <laughs> uh, can anybody hear me? Yes, All right. I can okay. hear you. All right. It is a bright, sunshiny day in San Antonio. At least it was earlier. <laughs> Not that I can tell from here. I, I don't have any windows where I am. <laughs> but <laughs> it was bright and sunshiny earlier. <sighs> Let's get started. Father. Father, we thank you for the sunshine. And we thank you that even on days we cannot see the sun. And we know that it's still there because you keep it there. We thank you for your perfect order of the creation. We thank you for your perfect order of the heavens. And Father, we ask forgiveness for the mess that we as man have made of it. But we know that there will be a day when you will restore it to the way it is supposed to be. And it will be far beyond what we could imagine. So we look forward to that day, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 20 is where we will be starting today as we look at no carved images and purity of speech. I will read verses uh, four through seven as we get started here. Exodus chapter 20, verses four through seven. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the earth, water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. There is a footnote here in the ESV concerning verse 6, where it says, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me. The footnote says that could also be translated, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. All right, that's where we're going to be today, those four verses, four, five, six, and seven. Question is, is all artwork prohibited? That's what we're going to have to address today, or only that is which is used for worship. And this is coming from Wayne Grudem's book, Christian Ethics, on page 278. Is it wrong to make images of God for artistic purposes? And what about pictures of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit? We will try and address all of that today. All right, what does the commandment mean? Well, let's look first at no carved images. In the book, Dr. Grudem says, the Hebrew word translated as carved images is pasel, a noun related to the verb pasal, or, which means to carve out or to hew something, often from wood or stone. It always refers to an object that is carved or chiseled out of wood, stone, or metal, and then used as an object of worship. In other words, an idol. Then he continues, while the first commandment prohibits worshiping gods other than the one true God, this commandment prohibits worshiping the one true God in a way that makes us think of him as having a physical form like something in his creation. To think of God's very being as having a physical form is to diminish him, to dishonor him, to ignore the immense difference between the creator and the creator and the creature. All right, let's stop there. Why are we not to make images of God? We'll get to images of other things, real or imagined, in a minute. But why are we to not make images of God? How does, how does the Bible describe God? When it talks about what we can see of God, what does the Bible say about that? For the lack of a better verse, it comes to mind. It was um, 
though we do not see him, we love him. So that is to say that God is unseen. And also in a similar sense, no one can see the Father and live apart from Christ. So I wager there'd probably be a much better context, but that's the only thing you can think of right now. Yeah, I, 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 we can draw that conclusion, I think, from those, those verses that you're citing. But the, I think the issue is not so, it's not so much that, for instance, you shall not see, you know, no man can see God and live. What, what, kind of, what kind of ramifications does that have, for instance? Well, the, the presence of something physical, for instance, three-dimensional, okay, that has height, depth, and width, maybe so, and I'm just talking hypothetically here, maybe so holy that somebody could look at it and not live. I think that's, that, that's something that, that you could draw from that verse. And, and we also know that, that there are verses that talk about uh, not being able to see God, but why can we not see God? Does the scripture say anything about why we can't, not, not what happens if we see God, but the nature of God himself. What does the Bible say about whether or not we can see God just in, in his nature, in his essence, in his being? And I would, say, I would answer that question by saying, since we had sinned against him, we were separated from him. And because of that, his righteous anger was brought toward us. But because of that division, he is so holy and that contempt so just and indeed uh, overwhelming towards us, we wouldn't be able to look upon it or... Put it another way, right? Why? Why when we and, are so fallen? We would. Uh, we are so fallen that we would not be able to comprehend His holiness. Right. I. I would again affirm that. 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 And and the Scripture speaks like that. But that goes to our inability to be in His presence because of our sin. I. What? Where I'm trying to go with this is the very nature of God Himself, apart from. Our sin, apart from the apart from the fallout from Genesis chapter three, where where I would go with this would be, for instance, John chapter four, where where Jesus makes a statement about the nature of the Father. He makes he makes a statement about the nature of God when he's talking with the woman at the well. He says he says God is spirit. Okay, and we talked about this earlier about God. God being spirit, and those who want to worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, especially as we're spending time looking at that in the Ethics is Worship book, that, that if God is spirit, okay, then let's think about, you keep that in, in, in this hand as we're thinking about this. After the resurrection, Jesus made another statement as he's appeared to the eleven that relates to God being spirit and whether or not you can see God. What did he say? He made a statement about flesh and bones. Was this also in John or was it in Acts? Well, when he's in the present, when he's in the presence of the disciples, they're talking about um, the nature of God and, and his own nature as, as he's, He's trying to get. He's trying to make a point with them that. Um, well, first off, it's not an axe because the only the only thing we have in axe is he's is is the is the eleven asking him um, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, 
And his response is, um, <laughs> he doesn't, he, he answers the question, but he doesn't answer the question. <laughs> you know, stay here until you are clothed with power from on high is how he answers the question. But, but he, makes, he makes a statement here. Let's, let's think about the resurrection accounts. Now you can look at John where he has the appearance, the, the appearance to the disciples in John chapter 20, but he really doesn't say anything about it there, does he? Unless he's talking about Thomas, when Thomas is a little skeptical here, but he doesn't say anything about the nature of God. Maybe if we go to Colossians, is there any statement in Colossians 1 about the nature of God and whether or not you can see God? You have your Bibles open up to Colossians chapter 1. By the way, the, the account I was talking about post-resurrection was in Luke 24 after he's uh, had his walk to Emmaus with the two disciples who are not of the 11. Because in Luke 24, he says this, see my hands and my feet that it is I myself touch me and see for, at, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay, remember John chapter four, <clears throat> Jesus had said, that God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and truth. Luke 24, Jesus then says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, what does that say? Colossians 1 verse 15 says this, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Okay, you have, you have the Son of God, who is the image of the invisible God. We have the Son of God who created all things that we can see and things that we can't see. Let's, let's address that issue. What did the Son of God create that we cannot see? the spiritual realm, angels and things of the like, unless right. spiritually gifted to do so. Right. That, that he created the angels. The angels are spirits by definition, and the angels are invisible by definition. Now, do we know that angels can take on physical characteristics? Yes, they can. And, and we could go to accounts in the scripture to, to show that, but we're not going to. My point here is, is that, is that Jesus is said to be the image of the invisible God. You could also go to 1 Timothy 1. So let's go to 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1. Verse 16. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience, as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, we have this statement here about, about the invisibility of God. How does that relate to what we're talking about here? Well, let me ask you this. How do you draw something, even if you are a wonderfully gifted artist, or if you're a wonderfully gifted sculptor, I can hardly draw a stick figure myself. I am not gifted. But what if you are a wonderfully gifted artist of whatever form and you want to draw or sculpt that which you can't see? What is the result of your work going to be? Will it be accurate? No, I will not. Why not, Diego? Because you're depending on, on imagination of something that you haven't seen, and so you're imagining. So you, you need to see it. Uh, very good. I would affirm that. And also, let's continue this. What if two artists draw or sculpt 
their image of that which is invisible. Do you think they're going to come to the same conclusion? No, 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 not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. Okay. So that's, that's, and, and I'm just talking right now, let's talk about that, which is, which is finite, which is, let's say limited, just let's say something is invisible and it is finite, like a, an angel. An angel is not infinite. An angel, an, an angel is finite. Okay. So you want to draw a picture of an angel who is invisible and who is finite. Let's say artist A draws a picture or sculptor A uh, sculpts out of, be it whatever material, wood, stone, clay, name your, name your substance. They draw or they sculpt and form that which is their representation of something that is invisible. Artist B then goes ahead and does the same thing. Are you going to, are you going to come up with the same representation in both? You're not. Okay. But even if you did, what's the problem with trying to do that with the invisible God is you cannot draw in time and space on a piece of paper or paint with your acrylics or your oils or your watercolors, or you cannot sculpt in time and space something which sits on my desk that will accurately represent that or better whom is both invisible and infinite. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And, and, and I think that's, I believe that's why scripture talks that way, because anything that we try to do to represent physically that, that being God who is infinite and invisible is going to be by very definition inaccurate and insufficient. God wants us to worship him, remember, in spirit and in truth, not in, not in three dimensions and in truth, because he is by nature spirit. And this is gonna. This is gonna go. We're gonna. Oh, don't let me forget to talk about about Roman Catholicism and relics and, and that sort of thing later on, because we have to go there. But the the command here is not merely just for making idols who are not God. This also goes to the issue of trying to make a representation of the true God, and we can go to. Um, Exodus 32 for that. So let's go there and see and see what Israel did. So we read this and pay attention to what scripture says the golden calf is to represent. Verse 1, chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, they knew he had gone up on the mountain. I don't know that you can say that you don't know what has become of him. He went up there and he hadn't, hadn't come back yet. <laughs> we, we know from... From the accounts in scripture that, that God's people here tended to be a little impatient. And, and before we point the finger of the new covenant at them, let us make sure that we are not as impatient as old covenant Israel was as well. Verse 2, so Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Okay. Aaron fashioned it. Aaron molded it. Aaron sculpted it. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. See, this is trying to represent the God who brought them up out of Egypt. This is not trying to represent um, a Baal and a you know, name your, name your false God. This is trying to represent 
what God looks like. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that, that I may make a great nation of you. <clears throat> But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give it to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Okay, we, we could continue. What they, what they were doing there... <laughs> is they were trying to represent the deity, the gods, as it says here in Exodus 30, actually gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And this brought judgment. Why? Because that golden calf can never represent rightly who God is, or, or even more so, what God looks like, because you cannot draw or sculpt that which is, is invisible. You just can't. Now let's go to let's go to first let's go to first Kings twelve because this thing gets quoted again here in first Kings twelve. First Kings twelve, verse twenty five. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. Okay, same sort of thing going on here. Trying to make a representation of the one true God and it doesn't go well. So why? And, and I, think, I think in the book, Grudem makes a, a valid point. Think, he says, thinking of God like a calf horribly misrepresented the power of the God who created the whole universe compared to the power of a single calf. His omnipresence compared to one calf in one place and his infinite knowledge and wisdom compared to the intelligence of a calf, not to mention his moral holiness and purity, his love, his patience, his unchangeableness, his eternity, his justice, his wrath, his personhood, his interpersonal relationship skills, the ability to speak, and his Trinitarian existence. The golden calf was a horrible affront to God's honor. It was proclaiming that God is like something in the creation, but in fact, he is the eternal, infinite creator of all things. He is not a mere creature. And I thought right away of Psalm 50, where the Lord says to his opponents, you thought I was one just like you. God is not like us in that sense. God is not like a calf that you can make out of, uh, out of gold and precious metals. He is, he is unique. He's one, he's one of a kind. <laughs> he, he is the infinite, eternal, invisible. Uh, you know, we, we, we can sing that song, immortal, invisible, God only wise. He's not like us. We are his creatures. He is not created. We are. All right. Question or comment before we move on?
Okay. The commandment also says you are not to make carved images of false gods. I won't, I won't take time to go turning here, but we can look at, there, there's an example in Judges 6. There's an example, you've got, a false, you've got the false god Dagon in 1 Samuel chapter 5. You've got Manasseh building images of other gods in 2 Chronicles 33, for he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down, and he erected altars to the Baals, and he made Asheroth and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them even Solomon. Now, if, uh, if you turn to 1 Kings 12, you can flip back a page if you need to flip back to 1 Kings 11. I, th I think this is important here. Remember, what did Solomon ask for? Solomon asked for wisdom. And the Lord gave him wisdom. But just because one has wisdom does not mean one programmatically acts wisely. 1 Kings 11, chapter, chapter 11, verses, the quote is verse 7 and 8. But we know that this is, this is the account of where Solomon starts doing things which are really unwise. Verse 1 says, he, he loved many foreign women. Well, the Lord had said to the people of Israel, verse 2, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. We've mentioned this before. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And what did they do? They turned away his heart, verse 3. Verse four, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Asher, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David, his father, had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did, why? For all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. Okay. You know, we talk, about, we talk about that which is here in the Old Testament can be used as principle and guidance. Paul says the entirety of the Old Testament is written for our instruction. And what can we see from this instruction? I think that we can say here that the, the wisdom that is involved in not marrying outside God's covenant people, and in the new covenant, God's covenant people are believers, not merely just people who are born into the covenant or have a piece of flesh cut to enter the covenant community, we can bring this into the new covenant and say it would be unwise for a believer to marry an unbeliever. Why? Because you can see what happens here. Marriage is not to be a tool of evangelism. Oh, I will marry him and evangelize him. That's not, that's not what marriage is for. What happens is the unbeliever far too often ends up evangelizing the believer and the believer walks away. That, that goes to you know, people who may want to marry somebody from, a Christian may decide to marry a Muslim. Well, you know, we share some things in common. Well, you don't share much in common. You don't share, much po you don't share anything positive in common. <laughs> but you, you want to marry a Muslim, you are doing what Solomon did here in 1 Kings 11, and it doesn't turn out well because there's wisdom in not marrying outside the covenant community. And the new covenant community is made up of those who have been regenerated. You don't want to marry outside the covenant community and think that you can convert that Muslim, that atheist, that Buddhist, that moon worshiper, that whatever, into Christianity by the, by the mere dint of being married to them. I don't think you want to do that. I don't think you want your children to do that. You don't want your friends to do that. Uh, my wife and I know somebody who married who 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 
at one point was a Bible study leader and then ended up, she got a divorce, don't know the circumstances, sort of fell off the face of the earth. And the next thing we know, there's a marriage to a Muslim. That is, that is highly unwise. And, and you can't say, even if it turns out well, it was the right thing to do. No, it wasn't the right. God, <laughs> yes, God can work together all things for good for those who him who love and are called according to his purpose. Doesn't give us license to disobey because we think God can make it all work out. All right, a question or comment on that? In the book, Grudem makes, makes an interesting point. He says, even if Solomon didn't worship the idols that he made, simply making them for his wives to worship was a violation of the second commandment, for he made these things as objects of worship. I think that's, that's important to remember. Even if you don't worship the idols, merely making the idols for anybody to worship is sin. You don't want to go there. That, that Psalm 135 says this, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them. So do, so do all who trust them. I, I think this is th this one line in Psalm 35. Let's let's think about this line in Psalm 135. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust them. Merely making an idol is going to cause you to become like it. There's a book over there in in the bookcase that is that is written by our sister's friend Greg Beal, entitled "We Become What We Worship." Whatever you worship you are then going to be formed into that image. That's the point of that book. That's the point of Psalm 135. Those who make them, those who make idols are going to become like the idols. Now, does that mean that there is absolutely no room for repentance? No, I'm not saying that, but we, we know that things didn't go well, for instance, for Solomon, that his, his making the idols for his wives started, okay, cl clearly things went down, downhill because of what he did there. And I, I know that you may grow weary of me talking about slippery slopes, but slippery slopes are slippery for a reason. <laughs> all, all things that really end up in error in our lives or within the life of the church they usually don't start off as something just dropping off a cliff and that going like that. Usually it's something that starts very gradually and then the slope gets slipperier. And it's like, the, again, it's like that snowball that heads downhill and gathers more snow as it rolls down the hill. By the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, it's not a snowball like this. It's this thing like here that you can use as a base for your snowman. So slopes are slippery, especially spiritual slopes, that dabbling in that which is wrong, thinking that, well, I can handle it, or it's really not that bad, or, well, we need to do something new because the old ways are, are, are wrong. I, I think you got to be very careful with this sort of thing, because to say that, to say that in 2000 years, God has not enlightened anybody within the Christian faith in how to worship rightly, that, that you have the new way that is the way to worship, and God hasn't shown anybody that before. I think that's, it's wrong. I think it is arrogant that, as, as I think Spurgeon said, there is no new truth, just old truth. Whatever's true now has always been true. And I think God has revealed truth to people throughout <laughs> redemptive history. And if we're going to say that, well, we need to do this differently, even though nobody's done it, and it might be, it might be pushing the envelope a little bit, you have to be really careful on that. That that worship matters to God. Ask, <laughs> ask the sons of Eli. Ask Eli himself. 
it matters. Fire that is strange is still strange at the end of the day. So we just have to be very, very careful in, in dipping our, our, our spiritual toe in that which is not necessarily right, but you, 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 you're going to say you know, to somebody, well, it's not really wrong. Well, I think you have to be very, very careful about that sort of thing. So any comment on that? Okay. Now, why? Okay. Why is the commandment here? Well, the commandment here is in, as it says in the passage, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I want to talk about this issue of, of divine jealousy. Now, we, we know that, that, that man can be jealous too, but let's, let's talk about this issue of jealousy. How would you define the word jealous? Bit of a hard one. Yeah, if I were to, <laughs> just with my own opinion, I would say there are two ways you could describe jealousy. One would be the uh, non-virtuous jealousy, which is like covetousness. Whereas um, the type of jealousy that's described in the Lord, I would arguably say it would be a husband seeing another man approaching his wife or anything like that. Yeah, the, the issue with... Now, this is where we have to go, that jealousy in and of itself is not necessarily wicked, just like anger is not necessarily wicked. We know that the Lord has divine jealousy, and we know that the Lord has divine anger. Therefore, those two responses to certain things are not necessarily wicked. Can they be wicked in man when man does it? Absolutely. That there can be a wicked jealousy, that there can be a wicked anger. Paul, Paul doesn't rule out all anger. All you got to do is read Galatians for that. He's not happy as he's writing Galatians. But he says, in your anger, do not sin. And so it is with jealousy that we have this issue of divine jealousy here, that God is said to be a jealous God. Now, what, what, when, you're, when you're looking at this passage and you're trying to work through what, what divine jealousy is, we, we can probably tend to understand it best in the issue of marriage, okay, or the issue of family, that um, Grudem really doesn't say a whole lot about this in the way that I wish he would have, but you know, I, I'm not omniscient either. We all, we all, have, our, we all have our takes on things. Um, his mentor, John Frame, goes there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at some things that John Frame says about this in a second here. But this issue of God being jealous, okay, and, and you can even, you've even, got pass, you've even got a passage that says his name is jealous, that Exodus 34, 14, his name is jealous. And we're going to talk about this issue of his name when we get to the next commandment. But God being jealous we can probably best understand this in the, in the context of marriage because we also know that scripture talks about the relationship between God and his people in the context of marriage, that, that the Lord is the husband, his people are his bride. That's not a new covenant concept. That is also an old covenant concept. And we know that God uses infidelity, unfaithfulness in marriage to describe Israel's sin against him. And we see that God's response to Israel's infidelity, to Israel's unfaithfulness, is that of a jealous response. Because this is his bride. And when his bride is unfaithful, his divine displeasure, his divine wrath comes forward. And that's clearly, that is not a wicked response. Um, now, we have a comment here that says that jealousy is a high degree of preserving a possession. And you think about that, that's, let's think about that in the context of marriage, that, that a husband is jealous 
to protect his wife. If some guy is 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 trying to come after his wife, he his jealousy rises up. The challenge on a human level is to make sure the jealousy does not become wicked jealousy. But but it also goes beyond just merely the husband wife relationship. Okay, we have. If I scroll down here, let me see if we still have on the meeting here who was on the meeting earlier. Yes, okay, we have a mother and a daughter on the meeting here. The mother is jealous to protect her daughter, all things about her daughter, okay, to protect her daughter's integrity if something is making false charges against her daughter, to protect her daughter's safety, to protect her daughter's reputation against false charges. And when those things may come, it is not, I don't think it's a wrong thing to have righteous jealousy arise because when those things are done falsely, those are wicked. And we don't want to see wickedness manifest against those whom we love. We don't want to see wickedness manifest against our wife or our daughter or, or the brethren. Okay. And, and, and we, we want to have, we, we want to have divine, not divine. Whoa. We want to have righteous jealousy because think if we don't, no, shouldn't, shouldn't wickedness bother us? We, we shouldn't be indifferent to sin when sin happens against God's people, when sin happens against people whom we love and care about. We should be righteously jealous. We should have that. Ugh. Now, the challenge is in that, in that jealous response, having that anger not cross the line that Paul doesn't want us to cross in our anger, not being sin. But this is the thing about, about the Lord, his divine jealousy manifesting itself in his anger never crosses the line. Never crosses the line. Now, we know that his jealousy, which manifests in anger, may result in some pretty severe consequences for God's people. We, we see it throughout the Old Testament. We see ultimately, we, we see it in, in the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, we've got, we've got God making this covenant with his people. We see him making this covenant. He's giving this covenant to God's people through his servant Moses at Mount Sinai. We see, do this because you're my people. This is, this is instruction given to a specific people in a covenant setting. And it's just like that in a marriage. A marriage is a covenant. It is saying, I will. And, and you'll notice that, that <laughs> whenever, people, whenever people make those vows, they don't, you, you don't hear people saying, I will do this, except fill in the blank. I know that when I do marriages, if, if people will let me do them and, and use my verbiage, I use the old-fashioned verbiage in there, okay, in sickness and in health and all these other sort of things, because I think there's value in that. And you'll notice there's no there's no appendix on the end. There's no codicil on the end of the on the end of the testament. There, there's no addendum on it saying except when he doesn't do this or when she doesn't behave in this manner. You are making an unconditional promise to that person in front of whom you are standing as you say I do. Well, the Lord has made a promise to His people here in this covenant, and. Part of the promise that he makes to people in this covenant, as we get into Deuteronomy 28, is he, he spends the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28 laying out blessings for obedience to the covenant. If you obey, then this will happen. But then he spends the next 55 verses, verses 15 through 68. Okay. Um laying out covenant curses, saying, if you disobey, this is what's going to happen. And you read them, and they're really not good. Because when Israel was unfaithful to the covenant, that is that which incites God's divine jealousy. And it can manifest in his anger now, we know that he is slow to anger, according to scripture, but sometimes he responds rather quickly. 
as in the case of an Uzzah, as in the case of the sons of Eli, Nadab and Abihu. His divine jealousy may not merely manifest in, as we're looking in the Old Testament context here, in the sense of, of some sort of short-term temporal punishment, or, or, but it may also manifest in, in something that happens that is irrevocable, like the death of Nadab and Abihu, like the death of Uzzah, because his jealousy is aroused and it manifests in this divine response, and God acts with, as I said last week, with a matter of with a manner of justice in exercising the provisions of the law. Don't do this, or you're going to die. They did it, and they died. And God didn't do anything wrong there, because He can't do anything wrong. So God is jealous. It is not merely it is not merely something that happens to Him. Exodus 34 says his name, and, and I said earlier, we're going to get to this, says his name is jealous. We're going to get to the issue of what God's name is, because we need to look at that with regard to the third commandment. So God is, and, and remember, God can't change, and God doesn't change. If God was jealous under the old, he is still jealous under the new. And in, in Frame's book, he says, in the covenant, God's name is jealous, Exodus 34, 14. For both marriage and our relation to God are covenantal and require exclusive loyalty. When we are disloyal, jealousy rightly ensues. Worship of idols, like illicit sexual intercourse, is perhaps the most concrete, blatant form of covenant disloyalty. You, you get into Deuteronomy chapter 4. All right, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Then he says this, he says, in the second commandment, God's jealousy leads to judgment. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Violation, he says, violation of the covenant law leads to curse. And curse in the sense of suffering a consequence. There's a consequence for, for disobeying the covenant. And this goes beyond just the, the, the issue of worshiping that which is carved out of stone. We know that in Roman Catholicism, there are things called relics, for instance. And Roman Catholicism, as they say with Mary, will say that, oh, we don't worship the relics, we only venerate them. <laughs> I found an interesting quote in, in the book by the theologian Duma concerning this when he was talking about this issue. He says this. <laughs> I, I, thought it, I thought it very interesting. Now I'm going to read this. And this is regarding, and, and Charles mentions iconoclasm. Okay, we're not going to go into that. But he says in, in, in the Roman Catholic fellowship, okay, even in the modern world, the image has not disappeared from liturgical use. For many in the Roman Catholic Church, the image does not say anything anymore, but that is not yet the viewpoint of the church itself. In the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the Second Vatican Council declared in 1963, quote, the practice of placing sacred images in churches so that they be venerated by the faithful is to be maintained. Nevertheless, their number should be moderate and their relative position should reflect right order. For otherwise, the Christian people may find them incongruous and they may foster devotion of doubtful orthodoxy, end quote. Yeah, <laughs> although the quantity may change, the principle remains the same, worshiping the images. What the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 declared was confirmed by the Council of Trent in 1563 and remains in force today in the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, you need to read the Second Nicene Council. Now, we're, we're probably familiar with the first Nicene Council. The first Nicene Council is quite orthodox. We, we're not going to have a problem here with the first Nicene Council. But you need to go back and read what the second Nicene Council has to say, because it has to do with this very image of endorsing and encouraging the use of such images in worship. 
Then he continues, people can make all kinds of distinctions, such as between worship and adoration, or argue that Christ, Mary, and the saints in heaven can be honored through images. But what was true in former centuries remains true today. And he uses a quote, uh, an old quote, do not listen to what they are saying, but look at what they are doing. Do not listen to what they are saying, but look at what they are doing. You go back to last week and my mention of the duck test. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like worship, it's, it's worship, okay? Distinctions break down in practice. See, that, that, that high wire act that Catholicism wants to walk between veneration and adoration not being worship that, 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 that dividing line is broken down in practice. All you have to do is, is watch or listen, and that's the way it is. So, so you don't want to go there. Because why? Because God is jealous. And this goes back to our issue of needing to be careful on, on how we worship. You see, and if you've never seen or if you haven't, you don't have friends in certain, certain Christian cultures, Certain Christian cultures are all about what Paul ran into in Athens. These philosophers are always wanting to find that which is new, new ideas that in certain, in certain cultures, which, which say that they are Christian, I'm not going to say that, some, that all of them are not, but some of them aren't, some of them are. It's all about doing that which is new, because that which is old, well, people grow tired of, that, that you always have to have something new. Well, I go back to what one guy who has been a great help to me, has said, he says, what you win them with is what you have to keep them with. If you're going to win people with that which is new, then you always have to have something new. And you're always going to be on this merry-go-round trying to keep up with the newest things in culture, trying to be like the culture. And, and it's all, in, in many of these cultures, it's all about that which is new. Well, <laughs> If you're always going to have to be innovative, at the end of the day, you're going to come up with things which are not biblical. Because that which is biblical is old. Oh, I know it <laughs> makes me sound like, like an old man, which I am. Makes me sound old-fashioned, which I may be. But I think that scripture, scripture equipped people to worship well when it was written. And and. Are people willing, really willing to say that scripture is not sufficient to enable God's people to worship well 2,000 years after the close of the canon? I, I don't think we want to say that. that. That that which is true about worship 2,000 years ago is still true about worship today. That we don't have to, we don't have to be on the cutting edge of worship. All, all we have to do is worship the way that God wants us to worship and worship him for who he is and not, not go ahead and create that which is really cool and, and, and really appealing to lost people because worship is not something that a lost person can do anyway. Lost people need to, lost people need to be evangelized. They don't need to be accommodated in the worship of the Christian church. Okay, question or comment on that? Um, yeah, about the cutting edge of worship. Um, we're not to make any inventions. Uh, inventions are not cool in worship. They're forbidden in worship. Because it's strange fire at the end of the day, right, Frank? Yes. <laughs> that uh, I, I will... Some of you have heard this story before, but if there's one of you who hasn't, I think it's valuable. Um, there was a, there still is a church in the, in the 2000s that was one of the most admired churches in America, according to a Christian magazine. Well, it was about 10 miles away from where two of our children went to college, and it was an evangelical church. So we decided that when we were visiting down there, we would go visit the church and, and see so we walk in, and now you, you have to remember, we came from small churches in small towns in, in Nowheresville, Michigan, and we, we drive up to this place, and now I'm not saying big is necessarily wrong. MacArthur's church out in Sun Valley is big. There are other churches that are big that are not necessarily practicing wrongly, 
but we pull up and, and they've got so many people there and the parking lot is, <laughs> uh, the parking lot's almost as big as the village that we live outside of. And they've got, they've got guys out there directing traffic and you, you know, the, this, it's almost like being at an airport, watching, watching the people direct the planes around and okay, well, that's your first culture shock. And then you walk in and there's, and again, there's, you know, <laughs> there, there's a, a couple thousand people there, I think. And okay, they've got the coffee shop, they've got the bookstore, you go in the bookstore, and you, you look at the bookstore, and there's not one book in the bookstore that you'd buy. And, and then you go into the into where the, the place of worship is. And it was like walking into a club. It's black. Okay, it, it redefines goth, okay, that everything is flat black. I mean, everything is flat black it's dark they've got scaffolding with the cameras and the lights and and you sit down and and okay you're waiting for things to start and you're going hey, but you want to be charitable <laughs> and and things start but they give you their bulletin okay they give you their bulletin and they have a disclaimer in their bulletin they have a disclaimer in their bulletin that says, we do not necessarily agree with, with the content of all songs that will be sung today, but they are used for illustrative purposes. Well, <laughs> and the reason they say that is because when the concert starts, I mean, okay, and what lights there were go off, okay, and then the smoke starts, okay, the smoke machine starts, the light starts flashing, and it's dark and it's 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 louder than than you can imagine okay i i have hearing loss because i listened to too much rock music too loudly 40 years ago i know but i mean it's this pulsing and 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 two guys come out and start singing i will not say the name of the song they start singing a song by aerosmith if you know who aerosmith is and there's content in that song <laughs> that you, you you don't want to hear about and it's one of the guys singing the song is one of the professors where our our children go to college and that's what this was like this was this performance and you just sat there like this the whole time watching the show and you you get done and i i i think my wife said that she was she was waiting for the lightning to come from heaven the whole time we were there. And that's not a bad way to look at it. That, Frank, you want to talk about cutting edge? Uh, it's cutting edge. And it was, I, I mean, this stuff was not, I can't see how this stuff would be pleasing to the Lord just because you try and put a Jesus veneer on all of this stuff. That that this goes and it's going to get to the issue of his name as we as we need to transition here into the second part of the study that that God's name matters to him. It's not just that which we call him, that it, it goes to his very character and his very essence as to who he is and and to try and wrap this up that that this whole issue of worship. Okay, this whole issue of worship matters. And in, in the book, as, as Grudem is talking about, okay, making, making idols, okay, and that which is, is, is represented, trying to represent God. He talks about, now, does anybody, has anybody ever seen the, the Michelangelo's painting that's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican? Of course I have. Ah, I was hoping here that our art expert would respond. <laughs> okay, can you describe this? Can you describe the content of the painting that is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? The paintings depict uh, the prophets, uh, both minor and major. They depict judgment, hell and heaven. They depict Genesis, the beginning of um, of uh, the creation of Adam and Eve, um, and they also depict God as, as old man and 
uh, a lot of nudity, a lot of angels, a lot of a lot of, a lot going on, a lot of themes. Okay, and okay, you mentioned okay. What is what is the depiction of God and Adam there? God and Adam. So they're like in they're in two different universes that are merging together by the touching of their two ind- index fingers, and so. Um, Adam is kind of in repose and he's reaching out to touch God's finger. God is kind of hiding some angels under his garment, yet he's touching Adam's finger as well. Okay. And what does God look like? He looks like, uh, a older tan Jewish light skin guy with a very long white beard and long white hair, muscular Right, and 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 this is the this is the point that is being made when when Grudem cites this in the book. Is God an old man with white hair and a big beard? No. <laughs> God is spirit. God is invisible. God does not have flesh and bones. That depiction is an inaccurate depiction of who God is. Again, you know, intent doesn't matter here that, you know, the intent of Israel as they made the golden calf was to make an image of the God who got them out of Egypt. But intent doesn't matter here. Even the best of intentions is, are, are wrong here. They're sinful here that you, you, we are not given license to make a depiction of the invisible infinite God because it by definition cannot be accurate, much less worship that. But even just the mere depiction of, of, of that is going to fall short. It is not going to be accurate. It, God wants us to worship him as he has told us to worship him, and we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Not, not as some, some old man with white hair and a beard, in essence, when you think of white hair and beard, is there, you know, is there any inherent difference between God and Santa Claus, or is it just because Michelangelo thinks that God is in better shape than Santa Claus and doesn't have a pot belly? You know, and, and you, you may go roll your eyes at that, but, but think about it. <laughs> as, as artistic as that work may be, it is wicked. It is sinful because it's not merely taking the image and worshiping it. It is making the image in the first place because it is going to be a wrong definition or depiction of God. It is nothing more than than saying certain attributes of God God doesn't have, that, that God is not omniscient. God can't be omniscient. God can't know everything that God cannot be all powerful, that God is, is merely sitting on the sidelines watching his creation spin away. That's the deistic view of God. And that's a wrong view of God, just as much as the wrong view of God is depicted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. All right. A question or comment on that? I would say it's, it's degrading. It's not only inaccurate, but it's degrading. It's limiting God to make a a picture, even though the painting shows man's ability, I think uh, his artistic ability, yet it's impossible to make a, a picture of Jesus or of the Father without being degrading. Yeah, this this thing of, of for instance, the the painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, okay, or the uh, the making of the golden calf by Israel. At the end of the day, it is blasphemous because it is denying the very character of God. That you 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 go to what Paul 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 turned over a couple of guys in First Timothy one. Hymenaeus and Alexander, he told he turned them over to Satan in order that they be learned to that they learn to not blaspheme. Now, blasphemy is still a big deal. It's not just a big deal under the old covenant. Blasphemy is still a big deal under the new covenant. And God can still be blasphemed. 
and blasphem blasphemers unless they repent and that's where we have to go with the rest of of the commandment unless they repent it doesn't turn out well for blasphemers because blasphemers end up in the lake of fire unrepentant blasphemers end up in the lake of the fire just like the liars and all the other things you see about written about in first corinthians 6 and in, in the end of revelation but i i need to address this issue of of visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. We have to be careful here with this issue of, if you want to call this generational curses. Okay. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Does that mean that there is no hope for the children of the wicked? You know, by rights, none of none of our children should be saved because the sins of the fathers are visited upon their children. But in God's grace, he overcomes and overlooks the father, you know, our our wickedness, and and yet he saves many in his mercy. Right. We, we don't want to say that because somebody is, for instance, the child of a blasphemer, that there is absolutely no hope. But what I think what the commandment is trying to teach us here is, is that it's, it's sort of the flip side of train up a child in the way they should go and they, sh they will not depart from it. The flip side of this is, is the children of these, these iniquitous fathers are, are, are more than likely going to reflect the character of their fathers who have iniquity. And we know that we can verify that from experience. Now, experience doesn't define it, but experience can, can verify this, that, that my, my, my life going into those prisons for all those years, how many of those guys who were there, who did what they did, fueled by some sort of substance abuse, okay, name your substance, it doesn't matter, how many of them were sons of parents who were also substance abusers? I can't tell you how many. They were raised in that environment. That's what they learned. They said, I'm not going to do that. And guess what? They turned out to do it themselves. And then when you talk to them and they're sitting there, they're sitting there in torment because of this their father was like that and they've turned out just like their father and now they're getting word from back home that their teenage son is turning out just like the guy in prison is he's heading down the same road and and they're torn up by it because they see it they see this sort of thing in reality that the guy's father was like this the guy became like his father, and now the son is becoming like the guy. But is that totally irrevocable? Absolutely not. Clint is right. Clint has looked at my notes here. Ezekiel 18, okay? You've got Ezekiel 18. You've got Jeremiah 18. Because what does Jeremiah 18, for instance, say? Jeremiah 18 says, if judgment is pronounced, but people repent, they will be forgiven. That, that Ezekiel 18 talks about, okay, that you're going to, that let's look at Ezekiel 18. <clears throat> okay, Ezekiel 18, behold, all souls are mine. Verse four, the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Okay, that is talking about every individual, every individual who sins shall die. First Kings, eight, First Kings 8 tells us that there is no one who does not sin. So everybody's going to die. Everyone's under that particular curse. But you, you get into, if, if, if we had time to read the whole chapter, and I'm not, I'm not going to, but verse 10, for instance, if he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends it interest, and takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. 
He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. And you can go through here and, and then read verse 19. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? Well, Ezekiel's point here is that everybody's got to deal with things themselves. That if the son repents, the son will be righteous. If the son doesn't repent, he won't be. And that's sort of the same concept in Jeremiah 18, that even when judgment is pronounced, if people repent, they will be shown mercy. And you know that from Jonah. We don't have, we don't have much of Jonah's preaching, but we have that which says in 40 days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. Judgment was pronounced upon Nineveh, and Nineveh turned from their sin. Nineveh repented, and, and mercy was granted. Now I was and I was reading in my reading this week I came across this in 2 Kings of all places 2 Kings verse 14 I mean chapter 14 all right. <clears throat> right here okay you've got you you've got issues going on here in <laughs> amongst God's people. Chapter 14, verse 1, in the second year of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadine of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did in all things as Joash his father had done, but the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings in the high places. And as soon as the royal power was firmly in his hand, he struck down his servants who had struck down the king, his father. But he did not put to death the children of the murderers, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers, but each one shall die for his own sin. You know, the, the issue is, is that everybody is personally responsible for their own sin. You cannot, you cannot call upon the mercy of God in your rebellion and say, well, I'm the son of so-and-so. Well, if you're the son of so-and-so and you are a, a wicked person, it is your own wickedness for which you will be held accountable, not the wickedness of your father. Okay, but God will grant mercy to the repentant. All right, let's go to the next part of this then, in order that we can get through this today. The name of God under the heading of purity of speech. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. There are a few things we need to look at here. We need to look at first, we need to look at what the name of the Lord means. We also need to look at what this issue of taking the name of the Lord means. And we need to look at what the issue of taking the name of the Lord in vain means. So we've got the name of the Lord, we've got taking, and we have vanity to look at here. All right, the name of the Lord. Tell me what the name of the Lord should be defined as. One thing would be God's character. Can you expand upon that, Frank? The name represents who the, the person is. So it, it would mean, um, among other things, it would mean his, God's character. You wouldn't take his character in a, in a negative way. I, I think that's fair because it, it's not just something God, when God reveals to us his name or his names, because he does call himself by many names in scripture, but they're not just merely a name. The name has meaning and, and has basis in his essence, in his character, as Frank has said. Uh, Clint says his name is also what he does or has accomplished. Okay, yeah, you can, you can go into, if you want to get into the, into the Hebrew and you want to start talking about Jehovah Jireh and all of this, but you, you cannot separate God from his name. That when you, you, you think about what is known popularly as the Lord's Prayer, when, when Jesus says, pray like this, 
our Father who art in heaven, what about his name? What is God's name to be in that prayer? All right, I can hear my wife in the other room faintly. <laughs> His name is to be hallowed. Hallowed. Now, oh, ah, there today. you go. Hallowed. All right. All right. Everyone's running across the room to hit the mute button on their phone there, right? So, <laughs> yeah, his name is to be hallowed. Now, what does that mean? We don't use that word in everyday conversation. What, but what does it mean to be hallowed? It means that his name is to be holy. His name is to be set apart. His name is to be consecrated. His name is to be treated in a certain reverential manner that, that scripture even talks about fearing the name of the Lord, not just fearing the Lord, but fearing the name of the Lord. Psalm 61 says, for you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Psalm 86, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Psalm 102, verse 15, Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. Isaiah 59, verse 19. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. Somebody can say, well, that's all Old Testament and all Old Covenant. Fear not. It's not just Old Testament and Old Covenant. Revelation 8, 11, 18. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints. And now remember, this is who gets the reward. And those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Revelation 15, 4. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. You cannot separate the Lord from his name. That, that, and, and you think about it. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other savior. You, you, can, you, can, you can substitute. There is... There. <laughs> You can substitute that there. There is, there is no other, no other under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You know, calling everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. You're not just saying the name. Every, anybody can say the name, but you're calling upon him and his character and, and who he is and what he has done and what he's like. It's not just saying a name. It's, it's you, you don't want to get into the mindset that, that for instance, about the name of the Lord or the name, you know, in the name of Jesus, when we pray. Okay. I, I, I got into trouble in prison once because I ended a prayer by merely saying, amen. I did not say in Jesus name, amen. I mean, one of the prisoner leaders went off on me because I did not say in Jesus name. Now, is it that phrase which makes the prayer effectual? I would say no, because you don't see anybody praying in the New Testament and saying in Jesus' name as if that is the phrase which makes the prayer effectual. This is, this is, this is being in union with Christ. That's how we pray. It's not, it's not the mantra that we say that kickstarts the effectual nature of a prayer. It is being in union with Christ by faith. That is what is being in his name. Jesus says, anything you ask in my name. Okay, well, you've got to be in union with Jesus Christ by faith in order to have your prayers answered. So this whole issue of, of, the, name of uh, the name of the name of the Lord is, I, I think that if we, if we can get to it in, in the time we have left, it goes far beyond what we, what we might um, think at first glance, but names matter in scripture, not merely the name of the Lord. You know, Abraham's name was changed to reflect something. And Sarah's name was changed to reflect something. When Jesus <laughs> is coming, okay, the angel says to Joseph that Mary's going to bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. You shall call him Emmanuel. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. 
So the name in scripture is, is far beyond just going through a baby name book and plucking out a name because you like it. I, I asked my parents why they named me what they named me. And they said, we just liked how it sounded. <laughs> okay, well, that's why they named me. So my name doesn't, didn't have any significance other than the audible pleasure it gave my parents when they, when they said my name. But that's not the way it is with regard to the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord cannot be separated from his character, from his being, from who he is. So that brings us to taking the name of the Lord. Now, Clint has already jumped the notes here <laughs> again. It's, it's interesting that, that many can limit this command to merely that which we would know as curse words. But you'll notice that the command doesn't say anything about speaking. The command says something about taking. So what's the difference? What does it mean? Okay, first off, what does it mean to take the name of the Lord? It would have to do with speaking. That, that would be one of the things that it, ha it has to do with. Well, speaking is something that happens upon taking the name of the Lord, I, I, would, I would hold. So, yes, because the, you know, the, the command says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I would, I'm going to hold that as we look at the definition of take, though, the definition of take goes far beyond merely speaking. Now, is speaking inherent to taking the name of the Lord? Yes, it is. But taking the name of the Lord, when, when, you, when you're going to look at what, what the word is really trying to convey here, I think it's, I think it's important to see that none of your translations, and it doesn't matter whether they are centuries old, King James, or whether they are contemporary, your ESVs, all of them say take. Um, our sister has gone to where this is, is going to go in, in the Zoom chat, that taking the name, if you're going to go to the dictionary definition, means to lift up or to carry, okay? To, do, do God's people lift up his name? Yes. Do God's people carry his name? Even more, do God's people bear his name? Yes, in, in numbers, God's people are said to bear the name of the Lord, okay? So when you bear, okay, or you carry the name of the Lord, what difference does that make in your life? Well, you are a Christ bearer. You bear the name of Christ. You bear the name of the Lord. You have, you have taken it. And therefore, you are one who is now reflecting that name in how you live. You are reflecting that name in the way you think, the way you conduct everything about you. Speech, yes. Okay, that yes, you do not want to use the name of the Lord as a curse. But you also don't want to use the name of the Lord as something that people can see in as you're sinning. Let, let's think about this. If, if we go out in for instance, you know, in a public setting, whether it's work or whatever, okay, and, and you do that which is sinful, and you know it is sinful, what are, what is your witness to the Gentiles at that point? You are saying you are bearing the name of Jesus Christ, okay, whether you are verbally sinning, or in action you are sinning, or, you know, even in your thought that people can't hear or see, you are sinning, that, that you are bearing his name. And I think what Grudem in his book, if we had time to look at it, and John Frame 
say in his book, they both say, and I, I, I would tend to agree with them, that any sin is a violation of this commandment. Any sin. Because you are, in essence, saying, now you, I, I know I'm using the second, let's say, we, <laughs> so I can throw myself under the bus here. We, when we sin, are not holding the name of the Lord in its proper place. Because when we sin, we are saying that we are willing to rebel against the very character of God. And this goes to then taking the name, bearing the name, carrying the name in vain. And what does vanity mean here? Vanity has to do with nothing, with emptiness, worthlessness. If we say we're Christians, okay, and we go and we go and sin, and we're bearing that name, we're saying with regard to that sin, that name is worthless because it was more important for me to sin than to not sin. And I think there's, I think there's wisdom in that, in, in thinking that whatever we do that is sinful, whatever we do that is sinful is a violation of the commandment here to not take his name in vain. We have borne the name of Christ now. We are Christ bearers. We are people who bear the name of our Lord. And when we sin, we, we are saying that the name of God is not what we say it is. We are saying that the character of God is not what we say it is, that we are not walking in the newness of life. We are not walking in the fruit of regeneration. We are not walking in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control when we sin, because we are sinning against the Lord, our Savior, and you cannot separate the Lord from his name. Okay. Anything on that? Okay, I'm going to go so far as to say that when I hear, now I haven't heard this in our church, but I've heard it in other cultures, and you see it online, that if somebody wants to say that Christianity is true for, Christianity is true for me, and I've heard professing Christians say this, that Christianity is true for me, but it may not be true for other people. I think that's a violation of this commandment because it is saying that God is wrong. God does not say that truth is situational based upon whether or not certain people believe it or not. God does not say that scripture, his, his revelation to his creatures, us, is only true based upon whether or not we deem it to be true. It's true whether or not people believe it or not. So to say that as I had a friend <laughs> who, who was on a church council in a mainline denomination, let me be nice and generic here, where this, this man was on a church council and the president of the church council said that, yeah, I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but there are other roads to the top of the mountain that other, other faiths can reach the same ultimate end as Christianity. Well, first off, first off, uh, clearly this, this person who is a highly educated professional, I'll say that, who is a highly educated professional um, does not know how to think logically or critically. Because if you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through him. There are no exceptions to that. There are no, oh, it's only, it may be true for you, but not true for John Doe. But to say that it is true, but it's not true, is to embrace a contradiction, and that is logical nonsense, <laughs> how much more biblical nonsense. But somebody who holds that view that Jesus is ultimately a way and that there are other ways is violating 
this commandment, that this is a violation against the name of the Lord. Because you're saying that God is wrong. You're saying that what Jesus Christ, God the Son, said in John 14, and the Holy Spirit, who inspired John to write it down, you are saying that Jesus is wrong, and you're saying the Spirit of God is wrong. And when man says, no, 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 I know better than, I know better here, that yeah, that's, you know, but that's too, that's too narrow a way, that, that there has to be other ways here, because that's just not fair. That is profaning the name of God, as far as I am concerned. And it is something of which people need to repent, because I'm going to hold, there's no wiggle room here. That, that people who profess to be Christians and want to say that, yeah, okay, Jesus said what he said, but oh, there's got to be, there's, there's got to be more. There's got to be at least one other way. Um, and, and by the way, uh, in the comment here, no, that's not who I'm referring to. <laughs> um, because I, I can say this, that the person being referred to in the chat here, and, and you on YouTube now and later don't know who this is, and it's just as well, that this, the person in the chat, at least from an educational level, <laughs> is, is, is not nearly as professionally educated as this professionally educated person is. Now, I don't want to say that the person referred to in the chat is not educated, but as far as advanced degrees in the secular world, this person had them. It doesn't matter who it is at the end of the day. It doesn't matter whether it's somebody who's highly educated. It doesn't matter whether somebody is, is well known or not, or it's somebody in some small church in rural Michigan that nobody's ever heard of. That person who says that there is more than one way to the top of the spiritual mountain is profaning the name of the Lord. Okay. All right. Um, question or comment on that? All right, so let's get to this issue that our brother brought up. Let's get to this issue of, of speech in general. I put something on the WhatsApp group, but there are some of you who are not on the WhatsApp group that um, I, I put out there for, for consideration this week. But let me, let me address this, this statement about, about what we say that it became, it became popular in the 2000s, especially with the advent of a certain reformed preacher in Seattle who, who had a large following and who became a best-selling author. It became quite faddish because he did this for others to embrace it, is that he would use that which we would call profanity from the pulpit or use profanity in evangelism or use profanity in everyday speech. Um, why? Well, because it's the words that people understand. Now that man fell, <laughs> that man fell hard. Um, that man has now started a, another church in Phoenix. Don't get me started. But his, his mindset concerning speech, especially amongst what would be known as, especially 20 years ago, as the young and reformed, lingers to this day. Let me ask you this. Is there such a thing as profane speech? Yes, of course. Okay. Now, is it just merely, Frank, because you and I say so, or there is some biblical basis for there being profane speech? Well, I know there is, there is holy speech, as there is a holy God. So then the words that we use must be holy, and, not, and something that is profane would be like taking a, something that is holy or something that is spoken of, like the word hell, for instance, and using it in, an, in a profane way. Right. Every, every language, every culture 
has speech which would be called profane or obscene or or unclean or inappropriate. All right. But does scripture go there? Yes, scripture goes there. Scripture goes there. Paul goes there in Ephesians. He goes there in Ephesians 4, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. He goes there in Ephesians 5, a few verses later, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Paul says there is such a thing as filthiness or foolish talk. He says there is su such a thing as corrupting talk. In, the, in, in, in a certain circle of the young and reformed community, the response to that is, oh, they're just words. You know, they're just words. Words, you know, words, words don't always have the same meaning. Well, we should, I, be, we, should, we should be judged by our words, the Bible says. Right. We're going to be right. We're going to have to give an account for every idle word, right? Yes. Absolutely. So the mindset, though, is, is that there is no such thing as filthiness or foolish talk, nor crude joking. There is no such thing as corrupting talk because they're just words. There is no such thing as foul or obscene language anymore. It's if, if you have a problem with it, the problem is with you is what we're told because they're just words. Well, words have meaning and words have significance. <laughs> these, these guys in John six said to Jesus, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Words matter. <laughs> and words matter because Jesus is the incarnate word. Okay. You know, get you know, those of us in San Antonio have to get the certain university out of our head here, but he is the word made flesh. He is the logos, that he is the eternal truth, the eternal reason, the eternal logic, the eternal rationalization come and, and added flesh to his deity. Word and words matter. There are words of life which would seem to imply that there are also words of death. That blasphemy, okay, that I'm sure that when Paul's talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander, that part of their blasphemy was their speech. That there was corrupting talk coming out of the mouths of those men. That's why he had them turned over to Satan. And it does matter. Now, I know, I know that somebody can say, Okay, to address the objection. The meaning of words change over time. I get it. There, there's, there's, a, there's a word I'm not going to use here because it still bothers me when I hear people use it. And, 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 and you know, I look at the list here and people under 35 tend not to think that this word is, is anything wrong. But I'll, I'll try and illustrate it when, when okay, a certain situation uh, arises and people will say about this certain situation, you know, that really blanks. Okay. You can fill in the blank and we can fill in the blank tomorrow if you want to talk about it. Okay. But the genesis of that word, as it is now morphed over time into culture, was highly profane back in the 70s. I mean, you didn't say such things in the 70s as, as to regarding the, the, the root of that word, that, the root of that meaning. It was, yeah, that you'd be hauled down to the principal's office if you would said that in the 70s in its original sense. So yeah, words change. Okay, there's, there's I, I get that there's a word in, there's a word in the King James that, that, was acceptable in language in, in the early 17th century. And, and all we would have to do is read it, that, that, if, that if you go and read about what, what people were to drink as, as a curse, okay, in the, in the historical writings, they weren't to drink urine. There's a word that if we read this from the pulpit now, there would be some certainly some eyebrows raised and a lot of side eyes coming because the meaning of language has changed over time. But what is profane today is profane today at the end of the day, that there, there are certain words which are offensive. You know them. 
I know them that when I, I was stricken by this going, going into the prison down in Catula several years ago. I mean, you walk into the prison and you can hear the prisoners in the hallway using language that is highly offensive and profane. You hear the officers using language, which is highly offensive and profane. And it's like you're getting a dagger stuck in your heart when you hear that kind of language. Because if you, if you live in our, in our Christian environment where people don't use that language, and then you go out and get immersed in that, whether it's in your workplace, okay, or in a prison, or, or at the mall, or North Star Mall, or wherever it is, or you turn on TV and boom, these words come out, out at you from the TV, you know that they're wrong. You know they're obscene, and the people saying them know that they're wrong, obscene, and profane. So our speech does matter as, as Christians. Now, why, why did I go down this road? I know, a, I know some people who, who, who determined to go out to Utah and evangelize the Mormons. Now, say what you want to say about Mormons, okay? But <laughs> they are highly moral people, okay? They don't engage in profane speech. They don't... They don't use Christian liberty as reason to engage in speech, which everybody knows is profane and offensive. Well, this couple had adopted the young and reformed position that they are merely words and, and they want to reach the Muslims, not the Muslims, the Mormons out there. And they're posting stuff on Facebook with certain bombs in it. So I sent them a message and I said, do you think this is wise? You know what they said? They're just words. Well, you know what? To Mormons, they're words, but they're words that have meaning. And you are trying to call Mormons out of their darkness into the marvelous light. You are trying to get them to walk in newness of life. You want them to leave their their ways behind them. And the way that you are going to do it is that which is highly offensive to them. You know, it would be like inviting a Muslim over and again, inviting a Muslim over to have, you know, bacon wrapped pork chops. That would be highly offensive to a Muslim. And again, say what you want to about the Mormons, but they watch what they say. And you're not going to reach a Mormon through profanity you're not going to reach a mormon through obscene speech you're not going to reach you're not going to reach a mormon with with gutter street talk like that you know and it's not just in the streets it's in homes you know i use street talk in in that manner but you're not going to reach you're not going to have you don't have any credibility with a mormon in, in if you're going to do that but whether you're trying to reach a mormon or not what we say matters you know, there, there are words which are offensive. There are words which are offensive, not in a, in a scatological, okay, context or a sexual context. We know that there are words which are offensive in a racial or a societal or an economic context or an ethnic context. They are offensive. That when I think of the words that got used in my home growing up, the way that, that, my, that my dad referred to certain people until the day he died, highly offensive. I mean, and, and it wasn't just about, it wasn't just about people with a certain skin color. I mean, it was, you know, he would refer to Mexicans in a certain way and, and all this sort of thing. And it was just second nature to him because that's the way he was raised. Well, that speech is offensive and we don't need to engage in that speech in order to reach those people who speak that. We can engage in that speech, which is pure in reaching people who engage in impure speech. We don't, we don't, that's not what Paul means by becoming all things to all people. <laughs> he doesn't mean that. He doesn't start talking like, he doesn't start talking like the prisoners or the officers at the Catula unit in order to reach them. He still maintains his purity of speech as he's trying to reach them. Okay, a question or comment on that?
Okay. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up there for today that we, we could, we don't really have time to address. If you have the book that you can read, you know, it's interesting that, that the thing that, that Dr. Grudem spends the most time on in this chapter, I believe, is the matter of oaths and vows. And if he's going to spend that much time, we don't, we don't really have, we don't really have time to address it. Um, so I think I'm going to end it for today. And next week, now next week was about lying and telling the truth in the book. But I think that we have already addressed that. Um, so I'm not going to address that next week. But now we're going to get into, okay, this is where we're going to need to be charitable starting next week even more charitable than, than we already have had to be. We're going to talk about the Sabbath next week. And I know that there are divergent opinions on the Sabbath, that I have my convictions and your convictions may or may not be mine. Um, but we're going to look at what scripture has to say about the Sabbath. And this is where, this is where charity and, and love for the brethren is going to have to come into play. So any, anything else before we wrap it up here for today? All right. I thank you all for, for coming. I actually get done a little bit early today. All right, let's pray. Father, Father, as we, as we look at this, this issue of how we are to worship and, and, and what we are to say and the very, the very nature of your character and who you are. Father, help us. Help us to, to not just believe what we believe, but help us to live what we believe. Help us to, help us to be people who speak well, who speak in a pure manner. Help us to be people who worship in a pure manner. Help us, Lord, to, to not, have, not have idols. Um, I know that the that, that scripture talks about, your, your, your word talks about God and mammon, God and money in, in Matthew 6. And I know that, that, even, that even in our, we have to be careful, Lord. I know we have to be careful about about improper adoration and veneration of, of Christian celebrities that, that I, I know that we may, we may point the finger at, at Roman Catholics and, and their view of, of certain people, but we, we need to be careful in our culture too. We need to be careful about, about, about preachers who we admire or men and women who, who we admire. And, and when you look at how, how they get treated, are they being treated as, as a form of an idol, Father, that, that our hope is not in men and our hope is not in women. Our hope is only in your son, Jesus Christ. So help us to have only that hope. And we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.